What's going on there? It's Wednesday, July 6th. I'm Frank Kershaw. It's the Wall Street Unplugged Podcast where I break down the headlines and uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. So it's Wednesday, Daniel Day. Daniel Kreese, senior analyst, occurs of research. Daniel, what's going on, man? How's everything? Frank, things are good, man. It's Wednesday, best day of the week. Glad to be here. Why is it the best day of the week for you? Because it's Wednesday. It's the middle of the yeah. week. I get to do the podcast. It's just, it's a good, you know, you, you work, you know, you work all week, but it's just fun. To, you're halfway <laughs> through there. You get to, you get to relax. It's almost happy hour time, Frank. Uh, it's funny because I had somebody actually at, at the last conference I was at. We always say Mondays. We make sure when we say Mondays, Mondays are the fun because everybody hates Mondays. So we try to say, you know, thank God it's Monday. This way you could work hard or whatever. That and I'm like, work. dude, that man, that's, you know, they're going to tell you the employees that they're happy on Monday. They're not freaking happy. No. Kid Rock has a great song on the only good day is basically Saturday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Warning on strong language. Uh, hey, you're looking well, sir. Oh, thank you. You got a, uh, I, I miss my, I need a haircut, something terribly, okay, but I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. So you need to look a little bit better than me. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am leaving for Vegas tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. Uh, a lot of, got a lot of emails. A lot of you got to be there for the, for the Meta Expo, Metaverse Conference, which is hosted by TCG. You're going to be a keynote speaker. I'm speaking at, I think, 245 on Saturday, which I didn't even write up my presentation yet or anything because it's been crazy. But we're going to have a booth there where we're going to be recording, uh, interviewing a lot of people and creating a big metaverse theme kind of documentary type thing uh, to explain what it is to everyone. And we haven't seen too many of those out there, but uh, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. We're doing a lot of work there. So our booth is really going to be about filming and everyone in there, even filming the crowd and asking them what the metaverse is. So if you're going to be there, let me know. Uh, we do have discounted prices on our website, cursoryresearch.com. And I'm going to be there Monday, but the conference is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Really, really crazy. Uh, we're going to be bringing lots of equipment, lots of stuff, and, and you get to meet you know some of the partners of the firm as well if you're going to be there. So I would say about 10, 15 people said that they were coming and you know, and they got discount tickets from our site. But if you're there, definitely come by, say hello, maybe grab a beer and have some fun. It'd be pretty cool. But yeah, so I had to get a haircut, and today I have my nice Kansas Jayhawk shirt on, which is cool. Thank you for noticing, Daniel, saying I, I'm such a good-looking guy. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. All right, markets. <laughs> <laughs> we can keep going if you want to give me compliments, man. I'm here. I don't care. I'll take them as much as I can. I don't get them too much, so keep them coming in. Uh, but let's talk about the markets because it, it, it's, you know, I hate saying it's kind of slow because people are like, oh, let me tune it out, and I want to be excited. You're going to get excited because it's going to be nuts coming forward. And the reason why you're seeing the market, it's kind of like, not really doing too much, uh, you know, we're taping this, uh, you know, early in the day around 1030. But the U.S. job report is on Friday. It's going to be a big deal. CPI is going to be a big deal. That's the following week. That's on Wednesday. Uh, Q2 next Wednesday. Q2 earnings is going to start this week, right, Dan? But, you know, the heart of it's going to be like two, yeah. three weeks from now, four weeks from now. Uh, and then you have the FOMC meeting, which is going to be at the end of the month, which is going to be really insane. Because what the Fed is doing right now, and I've covered this over the past three weeks, you're seeing... You're seeing it working. I don't care what you think about the Fed, whatever. It's about stocks, right? You can destroy the Fed if that's what you like to do. And they're terrible, late to the party, whatever, right? Let everybody else go there. We want to figure out how to make money off of this. But right now, it's like a holding period because we're waiting for this news to come out. The US job market's probably going to be pretty strong. The CPI, I'd be surprised if it's high. Might be, you know, I'm expecting it to, to go consistently lower from here. But we have housing, which is a major component, shelter, major component. And you're still seeing those high. Remember these lagging indicators? It's, this is from a month ago compared to now. Uh, but you're seeing, you know, airline prices also went up and some of the things, but, but commodities have absolutely crashed. You know, we're seeing the oil, we'll cover that later. But the FOMC, they expected to raise by, I think they're predicting 50 basis point raise uh, instead of 75. A lot of people think but that's, that's what's the odds of favoring a 50 basis point hike. We could see 75 basis point hike. That'll bring it to 2.5% of the Fed funds rate. But what happens after that? And they might say they're going to stay aggressive in September is the next meeting, but I'm thinking in September that there's a good likelihood that they could just stop or slow or say, okay, we're starting to see effects because the effects are really being felt right now. And you're seeing it across a lot of industries. I think you're going to see it when earnings, when these guys report earnings, because they're going to issue either conservative guidance or lower their guidance. Uh, but you know, that's my thoughts right now. What about you? How are you playing this into this into this market? Because again, it is the holding period, and this month is going to be really crazy in terms of news. You're going to see a lot of crazy stuff because it looks like we're going into recession too. Yeah, official recession. Of course, the the Feds have done a good job. Jerome Powell, chairman, has done a good job of, in my opinion, signaling what he's going to try to do. So I haven't looked at the most recent uh, percentages for the rate hikes and things. If they don't do 75 at the end of the month, I think it's the 27th. They don't do 75 basis points and then hint at another one. The the meetings actually the minute minute meetings come out today, Frank. Yeah, from the later past, later yeah. this afternoon. Mm -hmm. 
And they should be very hawkish. Yeah. And hopefully they're hinting at 75 basis point hikes this month and next month. And then then they're going to signal that pause. Now, total coincidence that there's a midterm election. We'll get to that later in a minute. <laughs> but to your point, it is working in the sense of I'm just not sure on how quickly that's going to turn into it. It's this buy the rumor, sell the news type deal. So you point out many times if earnings come out, the majority of results are based on guidance. Hey, this company can report a great earnings per share number and beat, but if they lower for the second half of the year, stock's probably going to go down. It'll be wild to look at this, the Fed meetings today, the minutes, excuse me, and the Fed meeting coming out later, because what if the recent pullback, and, and you're exactly right, uh, oil, uh, food hasn't gone down yet, but gas prices are drifting lower, copper is drifting lower, all, all the metals are drifting lower. But what if that doesn't show up in the most in the upcoming numbers? And if it doesn't, that may not matter as much because people might interpret and say, well, they're just not baked in yet. But based on oil going from 130 to 98, based on copper prices dropping, based on everything else going down, lumber, it might the reaction still might be a positive. Does that make sense? It will make sense because you have to factor in, right? We have to factor in, Daniel, is that a lot of these stocks are getting hit. They've gotten Absolutely. hit already, right? So now expectations are low. We're so used to, over the past 12 years, the majority of the past 12 years, let's say since 2010, uh, where expectations are pretty high. And when they're high, you have to meet them. You have to beat expectations. That's why you've seen a lot of buybacks in stocks with artificially inflate your earnings. Uh, there's ways to manipulate your earnings to go higher, uh, not you know legally through companies. That's what happens when you report every quarter, which you really don't need to do. But you know, whatever, it's good for trading. When I'm looking at earnings right now, I want to see if it's factored in because right now earnings expectations have been lowered for Q2, where they're expected to grow at 5.6 percent. A lot of that's going to be from energy. But when you look at Q3 or Q4, what would you think? Would you think the earnings are going to be higher or lower from 5.3 percent this quarter? I think they should be lower. They're okay. probably projected to continue higher, though. Okay, not just projected to continue higher. Q3, they're expected 10%, and Q4 is expected 11%. Growth. And this is year over year, right? We're this is, yes. So yeah. this is year over year growth, which is, you know, when, when I see that and those numbers, I, I just think they're relatively high because of the uncertainty, right? Just with China. China came out today, right? When it comes to the uncertainty down, they came out today and said, uh, uh, look, we're, we're, more COVID cases, so you might see further lockdown. So there's a little bit of a scare in China right now. And and again, we know it's supply chain concerns and they're the growth market, growth engine of the world. Uh, who knows? I mean, we have Biden going over there to tell him or I don't know if he's going there to just lower tariffs. I think he's meeting with OPEC or whatever, but you know, they're going to start, you know, dialing back on the tariffs and stuff like that. Again, you know, just for relationships with China, whatever that means. But China has been outperforming our markets. Uh, but I know that for the lockdowns, Macau, I saw they closed one of their casinos due to COVID outbreak. It makes sense that they might close a lot of those casinos now. Uh, you know, So the uncertainty out there is really tough where you have these companies. And, and also, if you look at Russia, what we did with Russia is when we took them off SWIFT payments, that was a huge deal. That was a big deal. It means basically we can't do any business with them. I know it's through the banking system and stuff, but it forced every single company to not do business with Russia anymore. And I think that wasn't really factored in because you're looking, especially through oil, right? Which is, we have a lot of business oil. Not that we do a ton of business with Russia, but there are a lot of companies. Even Netflix uh, reduced their earnings. They would have been, not earnings, their subscriber would have been positive, but it was negative. It was still down tremendously, but the negative number was because of Russia. So everyone's eliminated those Russia operations to take it right down. Exxon took a big write down, Chevron, all these companies. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they beat going forward, especially with the uncertainty with energy prices. And we'll go, go through that in a minute. But those expectations are really high. And we want to see when they report that guidance as a CEO. When you look at the CEO and you look at the sentiment of CEOs, and I have this because it really surprised me. The CEO confidence index, it was eight. It's on the scale from like one to 100. It was 80 in 2021, very, very high levels. I yep. almost record high levels, close, but it's at 40 now. <laughs> and and at this level at 40, just to, to explain to you guys, uh, it only gets this level during recessions where you look at, at 2020, 2010, 2000. Uh, that's when it was at, at these levels, a little above, above 40. So for the CEOs to have no conf that little confidence, I don't see them coming out and being aggressive, which is a good thing because now's the time to be conservative. You could be conservative and get away with it because your stock is already down. The anticipation is that they're not going to be great. So all you have to do is really meet earnings and you're going to be okay and maybe 
you know, maintain your guidance and your stock's probably going to go up. Maybe it goes down a little bit, but I want to see if it's factored into these stocks because I don't think this, I think this earnings season is going to be a little rough and you're going to separate the winners from the losers within industries. It's not going to be all cloud companies go high, all, you know, consumers, cyclical companies go high, all the airline. I think you're going to see massive separation within those industries of companies that are getting it done and companies aren't. And it's going to be really cool. It's going to be a stock picker's market. I'm looking forward to earnings season, see what these guys say. Speaking of CEOs who have a, uh, glass half empty outlook did you see metas marco zuckerberg formerly facebook <laughs> he was saying how things are going to be terrible and he was he was getting out in front of that and saying there was going to be either further layoffs or some people may end up leaving uh, without having to be quote unquote fired that's all fine how to play it like i said i hope the fed comes out and they are very hawkish in their meeting mi minutes today and then everything everybody prices in what's interesting to me is that there are a couple rate hikes being priced in rate cuts, excuse me, as soon as the first quarter of next year, Frank. Mm -hmm. So we could have a rate hike this month, another rate hike, a pause in September, and then a cut. Now, what's interesting, and I forwarded you this, just real quick here, and I know I know numbers are hard to follow and it's goofy. The reason I think the Fed is right to try to raise quicker, more fast, by 75 base points, even if they came out and surprised by one, it would be a terrible knee-jerk reaction for the stocks. But it, they got to give room to start cutting. Mm -hmm. And if you look at up to 2020, and this is why I think they painted themselves into a great corner. Fiscal year 2020, the height of the coronavirus uh, stimulus mania, the debt on our national debt of mm -hmm. 30-some trillion was relatively low. It was only, I say only, using my best Austin Powers quotations, 6% mm -hmm. uh, of roughly the 6.8 trillion outlays. Now, mm -hmm. It was about a little under four hundred billion in interest payments, debt mm -hmm. services. Now, why is that? Well, because interest rates were artificially mm -hmm. low. If you scroll down, and I don't know if you have it on your side, but if the Fed keeps hiking and we get to five percent, why is I why am I picking out five? A five percent average rate would mean that the service on debt is the single single biggest annual expenditure for Congress. It's it would be higher than Social Security, which is what one point two trillion, Medicaid. Medicare, excuse me, $826 billion, and the Department of Defense of $704 billion. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, and I know deficits don't matter. That's a great quote from uh, <laughs> former Vice President Dick Cheney. At some point, why do I bring this up? Because at some point, you're going to see a lot of headlines about the interest and the debt and people getting worried. That's going to be good for gold and Bitcoin, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We need to see that break away. Uh, but I just think the Fed needs to be aggressive and start raising so that they can only back off. And I think, and we've talked about this in the past, it's okay to sit on the sidelines or at least be scaling into certain positions right now. We can get into a couple of those in a minute. If the market starts pricing in a, a rate cut or pow hints at anything early next year, coupled with the midterm election, regardless of how that goes, you're going to see a massive rally in my opinion. So yeah, we're in waiting mode right now. I think the markets are going to drift lower between now and the end of the year. But again, I, I think it's I think it's smart to build your watch list and start buying in. And I've been wrong up to this point as well. I mean, I've been buying it here and there uh, across oil and crypto and things like that, and they're still going down. If 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 you want to stop the conversation right there and say, well, you're wrong, so therefore I don't want to listen to you, that's fine. But the world's not ending and you want to prepare for what's coming. And this is what's coming ahead. And it'll be great to hear, see the Fed minutes later and then see what they actually follow through with. Yeah, I think when people run into debt, it's a fantastic story. Uh, debt is only a concern when you have, when you see companies and people not being able to pay it off. Right? That's when, when people can't pay it. That's when it's a concern. You're not seeing that along the banks. The banks are stronger than they've ever been. They're buying back stock and they're raising their dividend because they're forced to keep a lot of cash in the balance sheet, and not lend it out, right? Do the new laws. Uh, but when you have to look at both sides, right? You say both sides of the balance sheet or whatever it is, isn't really a balance sheet when you're looking at, at you know income. So. We look at both sides, those interest rate payments. Uh, you know, we have you're not going to see five percent of Fed funds rate. Uh, it's pricing in right now at about three percent, maybe three point two percent on the Fed funds rate. Uh, and we could be there very, very quickly. We could be there by September. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be there by September, but if you're looking at debt servicing costs, interest payments, and and Canaccord has a great report out with great charts on this showing that interest payments are around you know five hundred and fifty billion dollars. Right, that's where they're going based on the current interest rate, but Nobody talks about this. Is the revenue that the government is bringing is three point two trillion dollars? Okay, so you know that interest payment. Yes, you have to be concerned if we go much, 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 much higher. 
But at these levels, it seems like we're topping out. With the 10 year at 2.8, it went to 3.3 and, and not going higher. Uh, to, you know, that surprised me. It tells me that the Fed, it's pricing that the Fed is pretty close to, to, to being done after this next rate hike at the end of the month. And, and that's why it's going to be interesting for the Fed because they don't want to sound dovish because, you know, it made them look really, really bad like a bunch of idiots. By, by being dovish and always painting that picture like, oh, we might only do this. And this is only like, two, this is what, a couple months ago. Mm-hmm. This is a couple months ago when they, when they started raising, they, they were like a oh, 25 basis point hike and, and uh, you know, they were trying to be, you know, kind of like, eh, it's not going to be that bad. And finally, the Fed said, okay, inflation's out of control. We need to do something about it. And for people to believe that we're not going to hit a recession is naive, right? Because the Fed doesn't care about a recession. The Fed cares about bringing down inflation. That's our biggest threat. Uh, the quicker that comes down, the better shape will be. And we again, we can always lower rates, but when they're at zero and you're seeing and, and low and you're seeing inflation out of control, that's when you get back into a corner. And you can't do shit about it, right? There's nothing you could do. So they're actually forcing a recession. They're doing that. They're taking money out uh, of the system. Uh, and to show you how much this is really working, guys, you know, we we could cite different things. And you know, again, I brought up uh, so many different things that are going on that you're seeing. You know, lower prices finally hit. Compared to everything just through the roof, and it was 100% inflation. Now you're seeing about, you know, 60% of the indicators showing, you know, inflation, where a lot of them starting to pull back, especially commodities, right? So when you look at real liquidity, real liquidity is measured, okay? And, and I don't want to get confusing here, but it's important. It's like, you know, real interest rates. That's what you care about. Real liquidity, which is M2, the M2 money supply growth, right? Plus equity bond mutual funds ETFs, but they also minus industrial production growth, right? So it gives you a more pure, right? This is, you know, widely covered. When you look at real liquidity, it's trading at levels not seen ever. And this is dating back to the 1960s, right? One is this is almost 100% of the time associated with a recession because you're taking tons of liquidity, but the amount of liquidity that's come out of the system is insane. And there's charts that you'll see it's insane when you're looking at real liquidity. So in short, what this means, liquidity is drying up. I mean, the Fed is doing its job. That's what they got to do, take money out of the system. But to see how fast this has happened and liquidity has dropped, it means, and this is something that the Fed's looking at, it means inflation is going to come down much, much faster and likely much more than most are predicting. And it's hard to see that because inflation is going higher and higher and everyone's like, holy shit, I'm paying higher prices. But you're seeing it. You're seeing it. You're going to see it within restaurants. You're going to see it in earnings. You know, the, the pricing power that these companies have, you're not going to see it too much because people are starting to dial back and they have to dial back with all, you know, I know energy prices have come down, but when I'm looking and throw all this in there, I could see the Fed going 75 basis points and say, look, depending on what's going on, you're going, you're not going to see the total 100% hawkish turn, t- you know, terminology. It's going to say, they're going to say, okay, 75 basis points, and we're going to continue to raise and it could be 50 or 75 basis points. September is going to be our last rate hike. They're not going to go past that because they don't need to. You're going to see that. I know it's hard to see. I looked at numbers because you're looking at lagging data. That's the data that we're fed all the time. Data that's from last month, the previous month. So the data that's coming out when it comes to unemployment, when it comes to CPI, that's from... You know, and, and remember, this is coming out next week. That is from June, and we're into July already, right? So, you know, when you're looking at all the data and you're looking at what's going on right now, especially with the massive drop of commodity prices, you're seeing prices being low, and I'm interested to see Prime Day with Amazon, you know, prices coming down. But the M2, that liquid, that real liquidity is coming down tremendously. And one last thing I'll say is you said gold. I'm not too crazy about gold because gold doesn't pay interest, right? So when you see the negative real interest rates, which we have, which combines inflation, Right, combines inflation with rates, we're still negative. But as inflation comes down and you're looking at interest rates higher, that's going to come you know, more in line to the point where it's, it's you, where do you park your money? That's what people, right? Store value, where do you want to park your money? Do you want to park it in gold? Because gold has been steadily declining over the past six months, just steadily coming down, slow, so, 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 so. Now you're going to see real interest rates positive, which is a huge, huge negative, at least historically, for gold. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, even with gold and Bitcoin, and we know what's going on with Bitcoin, and a lot of that, has, a lot of that bubble has bursted, and you know, another company just put a, uh, filed for bankruptcy. But you know, for me, that's that's a situation with the Fed coming in. That meeting at the end of this month is something you need to look at because I think they're going to say, okay, we're still going to be aggressive into September, but September is going to be the last rate hike, and that could be 50, 75. Or maybe even 25 basis points depends how quick we see this deterioration because liquidity is flying out of this market much, much faster than anyone believes. And that's what happens. That's what happens when you raise rates. That's what happens when you take money out of this. People cannot, they're not going to spend, 
their disposable income, discretionary income goes down tremendously, and you got to figure out what are they going to spend on it. Spending on services, you're seeing services do good, but a lot of those discretionary items and things like that and, and, and all the bullshit they used to buy and, and just the speculative names, you see it. You see how the risk is coming out of the market, but that's how I feel right now and everything. I know I was a lot there, so sorry. No, that's good. <laughs> Turning real quick on oil, would you be a buyer of oil now as it's been drifting lower? No. No. No, and I, I was. Well, that's, a, that's an easy debate. Well, I would. Let's talk about it. <laughs> okay, no, and and we, we need to talk about oil because you know you look at oil stocks and are getting plummeted, and you can say, well, Frank, they're up tremendously. Where you know Devin was five bucks, and I don't even know. I mean, you probably have a, you have a chart there, Devin, or no? I don't. Not up in front of me. No. I can All right. Let me let now. me bring this up before I start talking about. It. So Devin has gone up tremendously, but you have to see how much these things are down, right? So. Uh, and they're down a ton. And recently, like the last two weeks, I mean, I don't know if you saw the decline in, in commodities in general, like Freeport has gotten killed, right? You're looking at Alcoa as well was really, really, you know, just surging higher. Now it's coming down. But, you know, a lot of these names, even coal companies and coal and surprise because everybody's using coal like crazy now. I mean, it's there. It's, you've seen demand surge and it makes sense. But, you know, a lot of these things are coming down probably because energy is coming down and maybe people will switch more natural gas now. Price is coming down. But, Let's see. So we look at Devon here, and it's at fifty bucks. It was at eighty. It was at eighty, and it was at eighty. Not too long ago. We're looking at yeah. less than a month ago. You know, so when you see these massive declines, I mean, it was twenty percent, then it's thirty percent of these stocks. But you're looking at oil pushing down below a hundred. And to be fair with you guys, when it hit like one hundred three, one hundred five, and the way up, and I said, you know what, everyone's so bullish on this. You know, it's gone up so fast. I think, you know, it might be a good time to take profits. And stocks went up. A lot like Devon went up a lot higher. A lot of these energy names went up higher. And oil went to 130. And now it's coming down below uh, 100. $100 is, is huge, right? I mean, even 130. But here's the thing. We talked about oil. Uh, and I'll let you go over this. Look at the forecasts. I mean, as an investor, how do you play this shit? I mean, go ahead. I'll let you go. Go. Well, I think I don't have it up in front of me, but you're talking <laughs> about the city came out with a bear case. If we go into recession, oil could trade down to the mid 60s, 65 ish a barrel. Yeah. What bank was calling for? JP Morgan said that global oil prices could reach whatever, stratospheric. Uh, and I won't give you the price yet. If US and European penalties prompt Russia to inflict retaliatory crude uh, output cuts, which they could. Because they're making money selling their oil to Russia. Absolutely. I mean, Russia selling, selling, selling to China. They're still selling a lot of coal too. They're selling to China, right? Which is which is one of the biggest partners, mm -hmm. and even you know to other areas in India. India and, and China like are big buyers. Yeah. Of oil so right now, and you're looking at the ruble freaking surging. You know, when it just goes to show you, when you control the energy, you control something that everybody needs. You know, you're in the driver's seat. You're in the driver's seat. As much as we wanted to take away from them, Russia could absolutely destroy Europe if it wants, right? It's still 40% of their energy needs. But to get to the price right here, JP Morgan sees $380 oil, not $200, not $250, $380 in a worst case Russian cut scenario. And then you look at City going to $65. So, you know, as an investor, you look at this shit and you go, what? Like, how do you play this? Because if it goes to 360, it's got to be horrible for the economy, I would think. Right. If you go back and look, when oil prices usually rise, outside of going from 100 to 130, which is, you know, unprecedented, almost unprecedented. We really don't see that. It's record highs. But when you see 60 to 70 to 80, a lot of people associate that where people may stop spending and, you know, because because the fuel price is so high. And that never really happens because it's usually associated with a strong economy. That's why. I don't know how to play this. Like, I don't know as an investor, as an individual investor, someone that so called, you know, whatever, expert in news for a long time. I mean, are we going to go to 380, which would destroy the economy? But yet, if we go to 65, it also signals that we're in a massive recession, which is also bad for the economy. So, so what's the positive scenario here? Like, obviously, you don't want to go to 380, but even if it goes to 150, but to see a discrepancy this much in a commodity like oil is really insane. And I explained this a couple of weeks ago, not two weeks ago. You know, I got this report showing you know, just massive leverage on both sides here. And now that you're seeing it push below, now it's $95 a barrel. I mean, ooh, at 130 that's significant. You're seeing it at the pump. You, I know you drove by a gas station and said, holy shit, man, look how much gas prices came down. I said it. A lot of people are saying it. It was 498 here. I'm not and, there yet. And I it's, said it. I mean, it's, it's, it, you can get it for 440 now. I mean, yeah, 440. Yeah, I it up this morning. You know, so it's, you know, it was significant where it was like a $15, $20 difference when I filled up my tank. I mean, it was, it was different. So, yeah. you know, I don't know if I'd be buying oil, but why are you bullish on oil here? 
because I and and you you had a great call because uh, when you when you were saying hey you could take profits everybody's bullish on oil that makes you a little nervous it's significantly pulled back so n- no doubt you were right there and I also agree I, I think those price targets and they're not necessarily price targets they're worst case scenarios and all that kind of stuff I, I would ignore the the drastics the fringe side you know is it going to it would crush it on both sides if it goes to sixty five or three eighty longer term I think there's been a fundamental shift in oil because of how the oil companies are managing their money and their capital expenditures now. And it's painful right now. I'm down on uh, Devon as I've been scaling into it. However, looking from here forward, I don't see oil, even if oil goes to 65 or 70, I don't see it staying there for a couple of reasons. One, you have no incentives as oil companies to drill more and be energy independent. You have a lot of incentives for them to do variable dividends like Devon's doing, like other oil and gas. Venom has done that. In, in total disclosure, I put Venom in the dollar stock club and we got the timing couldn't have been worse. So it, nobody gives a crap about ExxonMobil and they're doing well. When <laughs> What have you done for me lately? So full disclosure. You have Exxon on that in there for a while, though. You do well exactly. Well, so you yeah, some credit exactly. Here. And it's been longer. So, mm-hmm. hey, if you held Venom for a while, who knows what'll be, what will happen? But when you look at the global scale, Biden's about to go, our President Biden's about to go over to the Middle East to ask about uh, increasing crude produ- production. We've talked about this in the past. Oilprice.com is a great website to look around for this. We can talk about it more in the future. When you don't have a lot of reinvestment to find new oil, the transition to get off of oil is not going to happen near as quickly as, as what politicians would like you to believe. And from everything that I read, and we'll get into this later today, I don't believe that there's enough spare capacity out there to meet all the demand. And spare capacity just means whatever we're pumping now and the Middle East is pumping now, if they chose to, what could they increase that quickly? And there's there's rumors out there that they could do a couple to four million barrels extra. And all that is just around politics. And I think that's a lot of unknown. So because of those, I'm, I'm more bullish on the price of oil over the long term, and I would be scaling into this. It doesn't mean go all in, but I don't think that you're going to have a significant drop in oil prices now from current levels that are going to be sustained. And one of my favorite hypocrites that I love to poke fun at, Frank, is still buying oil. Who am I talking about? Buffett. Buffett, Buffett has been buying Oxy. Oxy, mm-hmm. Oxy is the uh, Occidental Petroleum. Oxy, O-X-Y is the uh, ticker symbol. Hand over fist. And I'm just on finviz.com, which is a free website. And if you scroll down to the bottom, they show recent insider trading and such. So June uh, 2nd, June 22nd, 23rd, 29th, 30th, and July 1st, they are buying thousands and thousands, if not millions of shares of Oxy. And they're also buying back their own stock, Berkshire Hathaway, which is always great to see. And I would I would, I would, would follow Warren there. I think you can, you can scale into Devon. I think you can buy... Not any oil company, but the the big dogs. I think you can buy here as long as your time frame is longer than a couple of months. I mean, I think you can st- sock these away for a year. Maybe we can timestamp this if you haven't fired me by then, Frank, and we'll figure it out. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just I don't think I think there's too many political headwinds. I think management and oil companies are going to focus on rewarding shareholders and their balance sheets versus just drilling because of political interference. And I think that longer term. Uh, oil is a oil and gas is a great place to compound money for at least a few years. Yeah, you, you know, I have to. I disagree a little bit with you when it comes to oil. Uh, the amount of oil that we have to really pump and, and pump through this market, we have an incredible amount of oil. I mean, if you're looking at specifically, if you look at the the Permian, which you know, this is what I've done a lot of research on, and then I was able to go there. And sorry to interrupt, real quick. I was talking about the Middle East on the spare capacity. Yeah. I know we could, but uh, uh, we could, uh, but and not only that, you're looking at you. Know, what are what are oil companies supposed to do, right? So if you look at oil companies, we're like, well, why don't you put more capex into spending? Well, when you have a president. You know, a year, 18 months before he got elected saying, if I get elected, no more fossil fuels. We're done. Keystone Pipeline, done. Okay, we're getting off what, that's it. We're putting these guys, we're going to arrest, he actually said, we're going to arrest these executives, right? So regardless of how strong the rhetoric is, and and obviously no one's going to get arrested, as a business owner, if I believe that that person is going to get elected president, why am I going to spend so much when it's going to be a complete waste of money? I'm not going to spend my capex. I'm not going to be as aggressive because this guy wants to get rid of everything that we do. So that's what's going on right now. Now he's trying to pump it up. Let me tell you something. When it comes to oil companies, it's for shale areas in the Eagle Ford, where large basins is 
probably around fifty dollars, forty-five to fifty dollars. That used to be seventy dollars. They lowered the cost tremendously through the, the improving technologies. If you look at the Permian, yes, there's some that could pr- produce at twenty-eight, twenty-nine. It's around, I would say, forty dollars. Uh, you're going to be profitable almost, you know, most places in the Permian. But with the Permian. There's only when you look at the Eagle Ford, Dan. There's only 300 foot of, of pay, right? That that's the shell area. So you drill inside of that, then horizontally, boot your frack, boom, right? You know, vertical, whatever. Uh, and that's where you get the oil from. When you're looking at the Permian, it has so many different layers that you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. So the cost is going to increase as you go 8,000 to 10,000 to 12,000 to 15,000. Now you got these different areas like Wolf Camp, Wolf Camp A, B, C, D. All the way down, you have the lower Sprayberry. I mean, this is, you know, upper Sprayberry is is like in the Midland part, but then you have the Delaware part. But the thing is, a lot of this area has been drilled, so they know exactly where the oil is. So it's almost a 100% success rate when they frack because they see the oil, they know what it is because it's been drilling there for, you know, many, 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 many decades, almost a century. Uh, so the higher the oil price, the more deeper we could drill and the more oil we could pull. We just have to get the okay, and we still don't have the okay. And even all the oil executives came out and said that, and, and listen, you know, the federal lands or whatever, whatever we want to argue. The bottom line is this. We do have a ton of oil that we could be producing. You see how powerful. We cut off every single freaking thing for Russia. We cut off of the swift payments. We provided these massive sanctions, which we do all the time. When they took over Georgia, we took over Crimea. They knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, you know again, we, we were so predictable, right? But yet, look where Russia is. Still at war, still strong. Ruble's very strong. They're able to sell the oil. We could become much, 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 much more powerful than any time we've ever been in our country if we just produce oil. Okay, forget about this climate initiatives. It's bullshit. If you want to, if you want to do it, just take 20% of the profits and put it towards that. Maybe one day when my kids, 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 kids get older, maybe we'll have, you know, more wind whatever right but again you have this agenda of people that don't understand the market but you know that's what controls us that's what provides safety that provides the most powerful place in the world and we're giving that away to russia we're giving that away to china right now but when it comes to these oil prices we have tons of oil here we just have to get someone to to whoever you know a different regime different president whatever say okay hey let's go crazy let's drill uh and we see the effects of this. Now, with that said, where should oil be? I don't know. I know that there's a lot of leverage in the oil industry, and I know there's pe- so many people that are very, 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 very long. I've never seen more hedge funds go out of business than commodity-related hedge funds to oil in my life. It's always one of them blows up, and they're done because they're so highly leveraged, and it's such a volatile commodity, and it's so difficult to predict that right now this $95 barrel is probably because people are just so long and getting wrecked that they're covering right now. So could we go down to 92? Could we go down to 80? Yeah. But do I think it should be over 100? We should probably be around 100, 105, I think, on average. And then let's see what the economy does. But if you're playing oil individually, be careful. Would I go in and start buying these oil stocks? Not yet, because I do see oil going lower. Because as it goes lower, these longs are like, holy shit, I got to get out of my positions. I'm getting wrecked. I was long. I thought it was going to 250. JP Morgan said 380. You know, it's guaranteed 125. Everyone has 125 plus all the investment firms. You know they're long and they leverage the hell out of themselves, future markets or whatever. But when it comes to oil, just be careful. If if you like Devin, buy it. It pays a nice dividend. It's cheap. If you believe oil is going to be at 100, 105, you should be buying it and holding it long term. You know, especially now it's down 30% or whatever, the Exxons or the Chevrons. But just know that oil is probably going to go lower <laughs> because of all the leverage in the marketplace. And we're seeing that in the market, Dan. Not to keep going on here, but when you see like this liquidity crunch, when you see money to leveraging coming out of the system, people are selling their great names, their great holdings to cover their margin calls and all the shit, right? And pay all the taxes and everything else. And that's what you see where even good names are coming down. Oil is a lot of good names that are dirt cheap. They should be trading a lot higher. I still think that they go lower from here a little bit because, man, there's just so many people that are long and and it needs to adjust here. That's that's how I feel. But again, I could be wrong on it. You were dead right. And just to be fair, I was really, really wrong. I didn't participate in the oil move on the way up. Uh, I had a lot of people on here that I interviewed that that said, you know, you got to go into oil, which, you know, and and we had a lot of the dollar stock club and things like that. Uh, Some of those picks and, and ETFs. But you know, just missing it on the way up, but kind of like, you know, 95, 100, 105, you know, I still think it, it could go a little lower here and just be careful if you own oil, yeah, especially if you're looking at trading. Absolutely. Well, let's hope you're not completely right because I'm scaling in. So we'll, we'll revisit <laughs> this. <laughs> I mean, but you hold stocks for, for a while. Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. and, you know, again, you're getting a 30% discount compared to where they were. And mm-hmm. they should have been, tra- I mean, at 130, it's a, it's a game changer. But getting back to the shell very, very quickly here, Daniel, because I don't want to run too late. But 
at $70, oil companies will produce as much as they could possibly produce. Not deep water. Maybe a little bit right, higher right. than that. You see break even at 70, most of break even is 85. You know, they make a lot of money. They make a fortune right now where it is now. They make it a fortune where it is right now. But at, at set, when you go below 70, that's when you'll see them cut back uh, on, you know, CapEx, the places that they're allowed to drill on, that, you know, the president allows them to drill on. But right now, they're, they're going to be printing money hand over fist. They're going to be buying back stock. They're going to be raising their dividends. These guys are leaner than they've ever been because a lot of them almost went bankrupt with that. What was it? 2014 to whenever, 19, 20, you know, through COVID. It was so freaking bad, that industry, uh, that a lot of these companies, you know, restructured their debt, have much stronger balance sheets, and, and again, leaner than ever. So, you know, again, I'm not, I don't want to go back and forth here. I just think. If you're going to buy oil, make sure that you have a long-term outlook. If you're looking to trade, there's people that have been doing this for 30 years that get it wrong, that go out of business. And it's easy to go out of business when you use someone else's money. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and leverage the hell because you're right. You're going to make a fortune. If you're wrong, big deal. You'll be able to start another fund probably in like six months from now and raise billions yeah. of dollars, right? So that's the way the system works. But it's just interesting. And I will say this. If you don't know how to gauge it, you could steal $5 million from a bank or get $5 million, however you can, and just invest it in Bridgewater, right? Ray Dalio, who, which his fund, flagship fund, is up 30% this year, which isn't surprising that you'll have to front run the market, right? So nice. you, know, you front run the market. All day. It's not like Ray Dalio comes out. I love Ray Dalio. I'm a big Ray fan Ray. of his. But it's not like they come out with this, oh, this recession, you got to be careful. That, that, no, there's no, this, it's just, hey, this is easy. We're seeing what happens before it happens and we're getting in and we're getting out. We're shorting and we're doing all this stuff and we know which funds are blowing up. And again, you have all the top mathematicians at this place because they make 120,000 at a college and they're like, all right, we'll pay you 3 million if you come here. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you have all the top mathematicians, uh, brilliant people there and, and they found a way to, to do it where, hey, we don't even really have to talk about the market. We're just going to provide great returns for you and that's why it's the biggest fund in the world. So, if you can steal $5 billion, that's yeah, an entry fee to get in. It might be even more than that now. <laughs> I was going to say, that seems a little cheap for that Yeah, it one, might be but... cheap, but see what happens. So, if that's you don't know how to gauge the market, just go with those guys. And I'm then, used to uh, the outside play. looking in. I'm comfortable here. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. So, okay, what stocks are you buying really quick when it comes to oil? I like uh, I like Devon. I wouldn't mind following uh, Buffett into Occidental, mm -hmm. and uh, I would play uh, Buffett. I would buy Berkshire through a conglomerate of things, but I like the railroad that they own, mm -hmm. uh, amongst other things, to play oil as well. No, nah, makes sense. Makes and sense. And I don't think you know Exxon. I don't think all the big ones. I think are you know they have their hands in everything. So Exxon or Chevron. I don't I don't know that you're going to outperform other things depending on what you're going to compare it to. But mm -hmm. I just don't think that you're going to be upset. If you can hold it for the longer term, yeah, and I think you're going to see separation in that industry too when it comes to oil. Well, all the stocks went up tremendously. There's Small also, caps went up. We don't a need to get into it now, but there's yeah. also some neat trusts that have my. I'm doing some research on some. There's some Permian trusts out there that are wow. basically just holding companies. You got to watch out what accounts you hold those in. Mm -hmm. Those aren't best for retirement accounts because they're you know tax friendly and all that. Uh, but that this is the time, in my opinion, where you want to start looking at that when prices are down mm -hmm. and when you know. Prices could go lower. I just think there's enough political headwinds there to, to keep them back up. No, that makes a lot of sense. All right, we covered a lot today, guys. Listen, just be careful with the markets. You're going to see a lot of crazy headlines, a lot of news coming out in the next two, three weeks. Like I said, I'm buying stocks here. I'm picking away because I have uh, an 18 month outlook and longer. So, you know, I'm pretty positive. Uh, but we'll be here for you. Email us anything, uh, frankcurzioresearch.com. Daniel, your email? Daniel at curzioresearch.com. <laughs> I never say it. I just make him say it all the time. <laughs> all right, guys. So uh, if you're going to the Meta Expo in Vegas, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, Make sure to buy the tickets on our site, Curzio Research. We don't get paid or anything. They just give us 50% discount because we're, you know, a keynote speaker. Uh, but again, it's from Friday, uh, July, Sunday, July 10th. Come visit our booth. You'll probably see, you know, like a studio or me interviewing people, but I definitely want to see a lot of people already said they're going to stop by and subscribers and Curzio One members and stuff. So it's really exciting. I'm going to be speaking on Saturday at 2.45. Uh, but again, come by, say hello, uh, and it should be really, really cool and a lot of fun and different from most of the conferences that you're used to attending. <laughs> Just get ready. It's going to be a little bit crazy there, but you'll learn a lot about the metaverse and, and it should be really, really cool and entertaining. So guys, that's it for me. Again, questions, comments for the email, me or Daniel, and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow with a fantastic, fantastic interview. I'll see you. Bye.